We haven't got a, a Bible reading for tonight. We're going to look at a number of verses as we go through some simple thoughts that um, I've been thinking about, uh, which might encourage us this evening. You'll remember that in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays a wonderful prayer for the believers in Ephesus. And he prays along these lines. He prays that they might be strengthened by God's power. He prays that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith. He prays that they would be rooted and established in love. He prays that they might understand something of the magnitude of Christ's love for the church, that they might understand something of the, the, uh, the width and the length and the height and the depth of the love that Christ has for the church. And he prays that they might be filled with the fullness of God, which means that they might be filled with Christ, who is the fullness of God. And I suppose if we ever were at a loss and we were wondering how to pray for other believers, I would suggest that this is a pretty good starting point. If we make that our prayer for other believers, then we won't be going far <laughs> wrong, will we? It's a beautiful prayer. But Paul finishes his prayer with an offering of praise. He offers praise to God by using a phrase which we often use when we come to pray. Because in Ephesians 3 verse 20, it says, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that worked in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. And Paul uses that phrase, to him, now obviously he's speaking about God here, to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. And you see, Paul is acknowledging here, it's a, it's a, a prayer of praise to God, he's acknowledging that God is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think for his glory ultimately, but also for the good of all believers. And it set me thinking about that little phrase, God is able, God is able. What, what does that tell us about God? Well, people who know me, well, you'll get to know me a little bit better hopefully over the years, but people who know me know that I love dictionary definitions. If I find a word, I always have a little bit of a hunt around and see if I can find a dictionary definition. <coughs> so I look for the word able in the dictionary or ability, and this is what it came up with. It says it's often divided into two areas, an intellectual ability or a physical ability. And then it gave some examples. It says having the power, the skill, the means or the opportunity to do something. And then the example that it gave specifically was he was able to read Greek at the age of eight. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hands up, anybody able to read Greek at the age of eight? No, well, that's a very specific skill, isn't it? You'd have to be very able to do that. And then it went on to say, having considerable skill, proficiency or intelligence. And then the example it gave was, the dancers were technically very able. Mm -hmm. So if we've got any um, budding, strictly come dancing people in the room, then you have to be pretty technically able, don't you? And pretty proficient to get anywhere. But it's all to do with ability, isn't it? Whether it's physical ability or intellectual ability. And we can apply those principles to ourselves. We, we know that and we understand that. But we can also think about God in this way. Now, just want to be very clear here. Not that we want to bring God down to our level. We can't do that, we shouldn't do that. Because as Jim reminded us only last week that if God was only able to do what we can do as human beings, then he, would, he wouldn't be much of a God, would he? So we think about God in these terms, in terms of his intellectual ability. We think about his infinite wisdom, his infinite wisdom. We think about the ability that he has, the power that he uses and the authority that he brings to bring all things into being, his work in creation, to bring into being 
things that were not there before. But God is able to do that because he is able. And of course, as last week we were thinking about the resurrection, God is able to raise his son from the dead. What a wonderful demonstration of God's power and his ability to do things that we can't do. We're not able to do that, but God can. And there are lots of examples in the Bible where we can read about God's ability, where we can look at passages and say, God is able to do this because he is God. And one account that I, I love, which really demonstrates to us the, the amazing and awesome power of God, is where the people of Israel are being delivered from the hands of the Egyptians and they're faced with the barrier, the Red Sea. And we know the story well, don't we, in Exodus 14, <clears throat> where the Lord parts the Red Sea. But often a detail that we miss, and, and, and this just amazes me really, a detail that we miss, let me just read it for you. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove it back, drove the sea back with a powerful east wind all night and the sea turned into dry, dry land. So the waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground mm -hmm. with the waters like a wall to them on their right and to their left. Now, it's often a detail that we would miss, but I don't know if you've ever tried to walk across a really muddy and boggy field. If any of you have ever done the Morecambe Bay walk, it's very, very difficult, isn't it? But God enables the Israelites to pass through on dry ground. Now, only God could do that. He has the ability and he has the power and he has the authority to do that. I thought about trying to drive a car. If I tried to drive my Ford Focus across a muddy field, mm -hmm. it would end in disaster. Mm -hmm. If I try and drive it across a dry field, I might have a bit more success. But imagine the difficulty that the Israelites would have faced, the hindrance it would have been to their progress if the Lord hadn't have made their way dry. If there'd have been some puddles and muddy bits, it would have made their progress really, really difficult. But God completes this work it's perfect and he does it because he is able. And we see that God delivers his people in a, a wonderful and a miraculous way. God is able. And let me remind you that this is the same God that we trust. If you're a believer tonight, the same God that parted the Red Sea and made the way for the Israelites to go through on dry ground is the same God that we trust. This is the God who is able. There are many other examples. Time doesn't permit us to go into other examples, but there are many other examples where we see God's supernatural power and his authority. Things which are impossible for us to achieve are possible for God because nothing is impossible for him. They all demonstrate that God is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think. But we're also reminded in the scriptures of the fact that God's ways and God's thoughts are higher than ours. Isaiah 55 in verse 8 says this, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, and your ways are not my ways. This is the Lord's declaration. For as heaven is higher than the earth, so my ways are higher, so my ways are higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Now, I think it's fair to say that we as human beings have limited ability. We, we had some time with Keith and Sue and Callum this afternoon. It was lovely just to sit and to chat. And Callum told me that he can do his 13 times table. Well, I'm not gonna challenge anybody, but I couldn't stand up and do my 13 times table because my ability is limited. I suppose I have to think about it a little bit and I get there eventually, but my ability is limited. And I think everybody would perhaps feel the same. But God is completely able. It's his nature and his character because he is the one who possesses all knowledge. And the fancy word for that is he's omniscient. He has all knowledge and he has all power. <clears throat> 
And again, the fancy word for that is he's omnipotent. He can do all things. Nothing is impossible for him. His work is perfect and all his ways are just. And I was reminded of a verse that we find in 1 Corinthians verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 25. And Paul says this, that God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Now, when I first read that, I thought, my word, Paul's being a bit cheeky there. He, how can he have the audacity to say that there is any weakness or foolishness in God? But I think what Paul is doing for us here is reminding us that even the highest level of human attainment, the highest level of human ability just simply pales into insignificance when we compare it with the God who is able to do all things because his wisdom and his power are unlimited. Just to remind you again that this is our God. This is the God that we trust, the God who is able to do all things, the God who is our Father, the God who is our Saviour. Now I want us just to look very briefly at three verses which emphasise this point that God is able. And the first verse is found in Hebrews 7.25. You don't need to turn to it, I'll read it for you. Hebrews 7.25 says, He is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Jesus has saved us completely by his sacrifice, saving us by taking our sin and giving us his righteousness. And then the verse goes on to say that he ever lives to speak to God, to intercede with God on our behalf. And that's a wonderful thought in itself. But when I was looking at this, I found a lovely quote from John Piper. John Piper is an American theologian and he's written some, some amazing things uh, in a series called Desiring God. And he wrote this, and I, I'm, I'm just gonna read it. It's a direct quote from John Piper. I'm not gonna add anything to it. it it's self-explanatory and it makes very clear to us and encapsulate this verse, Hebrews 7, 25. He is able to save completely those who come to God through him. This is what John Piper says. He says, we need righteousness to be acceptable to God, but we don't have it. What we have is sin. So God has what we need and don't deserve, righteousness. And we have what God hates and rejects, sin. So what is God's answer to this situation? Well, his answer is Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died in our place and bore our condemnation. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he, God, condemned sin in the flesh. Whose flesh bore the condemnation? His. Whose sins were being condemned? ours this is the great exchange and here it is again in 2 Corinthians 5 21 for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God God lays our sins on Christ and punishes them in him and in Christ's obedient death, God fulfills and vindicates his righteousness and imputes or credits it to us. Our sin on Christ, his righteousness on us. We can hardly stress too much that Christ is God, God's answer to our greatest problem. It's all owing to him. You can't love Christ too much. You can't think about him too much or thank him too much or depend on him too much. All our <coughs> forgiveness, all our justification, all our righteousness is in Christ. This is the gospel. 
the good news that our sins are laid on Christ and his righteousness is laid on us. And that this great exchange becomes ours, not by works, but by faith alone. By grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Here is the good news that lifts burdens and gives joy and makes strong. I was really struck by that when I read it. Very simple, very clear, but it reminds us what God has done for us in Christ. Jesus is able to save completely, completely those who come to God through him. Our second point, 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 says this, God is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. So if our first point was about salvation through the sacrifice of Jesus, this verse is about God's abundant provision. Just to put the context for you into a nutshell, Paul is writing here about generosity. He's talking about giving generously. And that the principle is that Christians should give generously because of the fact that God is generous to us. And in fact, right at the end of this, this chapter, the end of chapter nine, Paul says, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Now, of course, what he's speaking about here is the gift of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a verse that we often use at Christmas, isn't it? Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. But we can't really put a value on that gift, can we? It's, it's indescribable. It goes beyond, above and beyond anything that we can describe the gift of his son given in love, given to us and for us that we might have salvation. And so the challenge that Paul brings to the 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 people of Corinth here is that in view of God's generosity to us, we should be abundant in our generosity, in every good work. Why? Because God is able to give us all things at all times so that we have all that we need. And this is all by God's grace, which overflows to us. Now, that's a wonderful thought, isn't it? That's a wonderful thing to remember, that it's by God's grace that we have all these things. And it's not limited. The picture here is it overflows. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. I was reminded of another verse in Matthew 6 and verse 8, where it tells us that God our Father knows what we need even before we ask. Again, that's another precious thought. And again, we can say that there are many examples of God's provision. We see it in the, the Old Testament where God provides food for his people, where God provides protection for his people. And in the New Testament, we see Jesus feeding the multitudes. All were fed, all their needs were met. And we know the story where even 12 basketfuls were left over after Jesus had fed the multitude with the five loaves and two fish. I always like to think that there were 12 baskets left over so that each disciple had a basket to carry so that they would see something of the majesty and the glory and the power of this miracle that Jesus had performed. But it tells us, doesn't it, that, that there was an abundance in the provision, an abundance. The needs were met and there, were, there was more. And when I was thinking about God's provision, I was reminded of a character from the Victorian era. Somebody that I'm sure you'll be familiar with. Somebody called George Muller. And he's best known for the work that he did in caring for thousands upon thousands of orphans through the course of his life. He built five houses for orphan children. And it's said that there were about 10,000 young Victorian children were cared for before his death. And I read this about him, it said, every child who left his orphanages or left one of his orphanages in Bristol was able to read and write, 
They left with a guaranteed job, as well as an allowance for clothing. And that was a, a stark contrast to the conditions that were prevalent in that day. You'll know the story about the workhouses and all the other things that were happening at that time. But these people that George Muller cared for was a, a real work of faith because he was renowned for never once seeking donations. He relied on God to provide everything. And he certainly did. Muller said this, the Lord not only gives as much as is absolutely necessary for his work, but he gives abundantly. That was his experience. That, that was what he, he knew to be true. And it was said that in his lifetime, God provided George Muller with 1.5 million pounds. And if we think about that in today's money, do a little calculation, it's about 86 million pounds. That's abundant provision, isn't it? For the work that he did. I think there's probably the most well-known and often quoted example of, of this miraculous provision was when the children were in the orphanage. They were all dressed and they were ready for school, but there was nothing for them to eat. The house mother told George Muller and uh, he said, take the children into the dining room, sit them down, and he thanked God for the food, food that they didn't have at that time. But he thanked God for it. Within a couple of minutes, there was a knock on the door and it was the baker. And the baker said to Mr. Muller, last night I couldn't sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need bread this morning. So I got up and baked three, three batches for you. And just keep the door open, I'm just gonna bring it in for you now. And then soon after there was a knock on the door. It was the milkman. The milk cart had broken down in front of the orphanage and the milk would have spoiled by the time the wheel was fixed. And he asked George Muller if he could use some free milk. And of course the answer was yes. And the milk came in, in the three large, uh, sorry, 10 large cans, and there was just enough for the 300 children to drink. That's provision, isn't it? That's God's provision. That's wonderful. And his life was a testimony, testimony of miraculous provision. Why? Because God is able to make all grace overflow to you so that in all things, at all times, having all you need, you will excel in every good work. Now, that verse, as well as remind us about God's provision, poses us with a challenge as well, I think. Because when we view God's generosity to us in giving us his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, in view of that, it makes me think, am I generous? Do I recognise that all I have is given to me by God whose grace overflows to me? And it makes me think, will I trust God for all that I need today? and into the future. So we've thought about God's salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ. We've thought about God's wonderful provision whose grace overflows to us so that in all things at all times we have everything that we need so that we can excel in every good work. Our third verse, our third thought is about protection. I'm gonna take you to a verse in John's Gospel. John chapter 3 and verse 10, verses 27 to 30. And John writes this. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given, to, given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the Father are one. I was particularly struck by these words. I've read John's Gospel many times, but I was struck by these words and it set me thinking and asking the question, if no one can snatch me out of God's hand, no one can snatch me out of Jesus' hand, what does that tell me about God and the Lord Jesus Christ? 
Well, it tells me this firstly, that there's double security for me. We're held in the hand of the Father and held in the hand of the Son. And we can only say this, we can only say that nobody can snatch us out of his hand because God is able to hold us fast and firmly in his hand so that nobody can take us away from him. I was reminded of a, a, a game I used to play with my dad when I was a young boy. And my dad would take something out of his pocket. He'd put his hands behind his back and then he'd bring his hands to the front and he'd say, which one is it in? And because I didn't know what it was. It could have been a coin or a sweet or something. And my dad would, would hold his hands and I'd, and I'd pick a hand and he'd say, well, go on then. You open my hand and you can have it. And I'd bend his fingers and I'd struggle to try and get his fingers open. And in the end, I'd open my dad's, well, my dad would open his hand and he'd give me whatever was there. And it just reminded me that the situation that we're in as believers is a little bit like that. That God holds us in his hand. And I had this, this idea that the devil was there trying to prise open God's fingers so that he could get to us. But God isn't like my dad because my dad would just give up and open his hand and give me what was ever, whatever was there. God will never open his hand to let the devil snatch us out. He'll hold us there. And we sang in our first hymn some wonderful, wonderful words. We sang, Father-like, he tends and spurs us. Well, our feeble frame he knows. In his hands... He gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. And I, I, I was just thinking about this last night as I was reading over these notes again. And I was thinking the fact that God holds us gently in his hand. He doesn't crush us. He holds us gently. But he holds us firmly enough so that the evil one cannot snatch us from his grasp. In his hands, he gently bears us, rescues us from all our foes. And Paul writes about this in his letter to the Romans. He writes this, that he's convinced, that he's absolutely certain, that he's definite, he's confident that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We're held in his hand. That's a real blessing. It's a real blessing. Are you convinced of that today? Are you convinced that there is nothing that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus? Well, be convinced because that's the situation that we have as believers. And the wonderful thing is that God graciously and lovingly does this for us. He saves us, he provides for us, he holds us and protects us. And we can be in no doubt whatsoever that our God is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think for his glory and for our good. We're going to sing again another hymn. We're going to sing <coughs> number 10 in the supplement. Another one of my favourite, favourite songs. And the last verse just reminds us of that lovely truth, doesn't it? No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here, in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Let's stand to sing number 10 in Christ alone. Thank you. 